one of the things I was thinking about talking um, with everyone today um, is Xanadu, so we're, we're building a quantum computer. And it's often quantum computing, not just Xanadu, but uh, people in the quantum computing space. Uh, it's always, when you think of quantum computing, you are thinking about something that can literally change the world. And uh, the caveat for that is it's very, very hard to build one of these computers. But it is true. Uh, if one of these computers can be built, then you're actually looking at changing the world. Um, you know, one of the classic examples is in, in pharma and drug discovery. Um, you can actually use a quantum computer to simulate something else. And this something else is the ability to discover new drugs. And ultimately, everything has at its origin uh, quantum physics and the properties of quantum physics. Uh, current computers that we have today are, are not quantum, so they often just uh, a fairly good approximation of things. Um, and also the discover discovery of new materials, new batteries, for instance, and things like that. It will, it will, uh, the world will look different uh, the day after a quantum computer is built. So I always think about this thing about you know, changing the world. And I think uh, we say it, other people in quantum computing say it, and also everyone says it, really, when you're trying to raise money. Uh, you have an app, you have a product, whatever it is, and it's going to change the world. And there's some truth to it. There's also a, a lot of hype. We, we exploit that as well. Um, in our case, it is true, but as I mentioned, it's very, very hard to, do, to build one of these computers. We believe we can, along with other groups. Uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about is in terms of motivation. And after a while, when you're thinking about these things obsessively, day in and day out, say building a quantum computer, whatever this thing is changing the world, it loses its meaning, changing the world. It just becomes something that you kind of get used to. Um, so, you know, a good example, you know, I could picture myself, for instance, um, you know, I think of SpaceX, and their mission is to, um, you know, put humans on Mars and other things. And that's really fascinating, and it's really enjoyable, and it's really inspiring. But if you think about that every day, it just becomes kind of mundane, I think. You know, you get used to it. The, the, the human mind gets used to anything. Um, and so I think, um, you know, for us personally, how do we kind of uh, continually motivate ourselves to, to, you know, keep, you know, ironically enough, wanting to change the world? And I think it comes back to two things. It's, it's not letting go of this, this thinking of wanting to change the world, because that's what gets us up early in the morning and late at night when we go to bed and we're still thinking about it. It is one of these things that you have to be obsessed about. And actually, I saw uh, in the article... Uh, I think there's two articles, but one today by Jack Ma, and um, there's that 996 thing. Uh, I love it. I think it's awesome. <laughs> and I think that comes back to, um, Andrew was mentioning about uh, doing something great in Toronto. I'm from Australia, so I have a different perspective of Toronto. I, I just love it so much, and a lot of people say they love uh, Australia, and I'm like, why? You know, it's just because you get used to things, and... Um, you know, so I, that 996, I think it's controversial. Some people like it, some people don't, um, you know, to each his own. But if you do want to change the world and do something obsessively, you can't just do 9 to 5. You have to almost, by definition, um, have to do this 996 thing. And also, it's just, a lot of us do it because we love doing it. So you have to have, I think, the, 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 the ultimate motivation of changing the world. I think that's important, like the, the final uh, piece, uh, you know, destination where you're going to. But a lot of times, I think, when you do achieve the final des destination, it's a bit of an anticlimax because, for our, in our case, it's going to be years uh, before we build this ultimate computer. There will be milestones along the way where we have a cloud computing system and we'll be able to solve a small subset of problems, still better than any other cloud computing company in the world. Um, but the other thing we come back to is, is uh, not only the end goal, but what is it that you love about um, quantum computing on a day-to-day -day basis? That's the real thing that, you know, this uh, double double sort of approach there. And so for me personally, I just love the idea of looking at the mathematics, looking at the research papers. And these equations are, are pretty remarkable. And then uh, I love reading, I love learning. And then these equations, you sort of think, it then connects to the final thing, whether it's putting people on Mars or in our case, building a computer that no other, uh, I mean, it's quite incredible. One of our chips will replace 30 million CPUs and for certain problems. So it's like, wow, that's crazy. And that all comes from the mathematics. And when you try to find use, use cases for companies and businesses, we're focusing on finance, you always have to match the mathematics of our computer, the in inherent mathematics, and match it to, say, in finance, um, options and derivative pricings, whatever it is. So that's fun. You do that on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. 
And, um, but you can kind of, you know, oscillate back and forth between what is it that you love coming into work to do? And sometimes on the weekends or late at night, oh yeah, we're here to also change the world. Um, because I think both are needed. They're both uh, intrinsically connected. And if you only have one, um, you're not going to, you know, go the distance. And the other one, you're going to kind of get burned out, I guess. Uh, so that's one of the things that we've learned uh, where we are in an industry that can actually, um, you know, truly change the world. That's it. Thank you. Question, questions? Hey. So, I'm a programmer, but. Oh, okay. So, my name is William. Uh, I'm a programmer, but I don't understand quantum computing. Uh -huh. So, my question is how would you explain quantum computing to like a regular person? I just wouldn't. <laughs> Um, it's, it's very hard to understand. Um, a lot of it is the mathematics says it so, and then you, you know, the last 20, 30 years, the experiments in, in labs around the world have shown that these weird effects are actually true. So that's the first thing. It's just you have to um, just believe it to be true because a lot of scientists around the world for many decades now have shown things like entanglement and superposition actually uh, exist. Um, I guess the generic way to explain it is... Um, uh, you know, all our digital components have at the basis uh, the inputs of zeros and ones, um, and then you have gates acting on them. A quantum computer does something similar. It does definitely that, but it also has a superposition. So you can have zero and one um, occurring as a state uh, rather than just individually, and you can act the gates on both states at the same time. Uh, so you get this speed up, this parallelization. Uh, effectively, it scales exponentially two to the n. So that's where... Um, that's one way I would try to uh, explain it. What future of the world do you see, um, with, let's say within 2050? You know, how, do you how do you see quantum computing playing in your vision of the world? Um, 2050? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think we can, it's always risky making you know, um, statements about the future, but at that point we should have a full fault tolerant quantum computer. And so if no one's, um, just to sort of let everyone know what that means, it's the most powerful version of a quantum computer. We're in the era now where we don't care about fault tolerance. Um, what can you do with a noisy quantum computer? You can do some really cool things. Um, so we hope to get to that point. And that opens up many things. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, a lot of people are, are touting quantum computing to really um, alleviate or solve global warming, you know, solve cancer, all the amazing things. Um, uh, new batteries, new materials that we would not have been able to unearth without a quantum computer. Um, so that's, that's where we're headed. I'm not sure if we'll get there at that point, uh, but definitely these machines are getting more and more powerful. One more question. Oh, yeah, I got, I got one. Sorry, I can jump on the mic. It, it seems like it's something that can change the world, and I'm just wondering about sort of government involvement, global collaboration. Like, it seems like a really important thing we've got to get right and keep it in the hands of the good people versus the bad people. Uh, just over. I don't know point. who's who. <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, maybe if you can comment on government involvement or global collaboration on how this will pan out. Yeah. So um, as was mentioned, our team is made up of uh, uh, 35 people, and most of them are from all around the world. So inherently, this research has come from universities all over the world. So you already have this collaboration uh, going on. Um, and then you look at another angle to sort of look at is um, the U.S. and China. They're both putting a lot of money in, particularly China. So I think, um, I think certain aspects of quantum computing may be regulated already by ITAR and restrictions um, where ITAR is the U.S. Um, regulations where it can be looked at as, as a weapon technically. Um, so I think, um, you know, one of the great uh, aspects of quantum computing is to crack uh, security. That's something that's maybe 10, 15 years away, but that's one of the uh, first use cases. Uh, but I, I think um, it's really hard to stop technology. You know, I think many, many people are working on it now. And the other thing, too, it's so freaking hard to build. It's so tough. So it's not uh, imminent, and there's going to be certain phases as it gets more and more powerful. So there'll be enough time to regulate if there's a need for that. Um, but I think it's already a worldwide effort, and uh, you need collaborators from all over the world. Uh, so I'm not sure, to be honest, how it's going to play out. But so far, it's very collaborative. Um, you know, when I was at university, I worked with people in China and all over the world. So that's still going. Uh, but now some of the um, companies are getting involved, like 
Huawei, Alibaba, and so forth. And maybe the governments will start getting involved uh, at some point. But it, it's hard to really know why they would get involved because the security side is an obvious one. But um, there's going to be solutions to current encryption that are resistant against a quantum computer. So then it's about developing new batteries and uh, new materials and things like that. So there's a lot of good that can come out of it. The answer is I, I don't really know how it's going to play out. But I think it can, will keep progressing for a long time before that becomes an issue. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, everyone.